I, I can't figure it out. I just can't see it. Well, in Genesis, um, you know, when it talks about God creating Adam, it says he created Adam in his image. Um, but then after the fall, um, and they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, uh, it says that Adam and Eve's children were in Adam's image. You know what I mean? It's, it's There's a distinction there between Adam being created in God's image and Adam's progeny being created in his image. And, and that tells you I think right there that um, at that point, after that, all, all of his offspring, they, they were born into that fallen state. You know, it was as if, you know, Adam had a disease that he passed to his children. A physician can come in and cure that disease for Adam, but then they, that physician still has to cure that disease throughout in those people, throughout those people, through history. Okay. Um, you know what I mean? You couldn't just cure Adam and then expect his children to be cured of that same disease without treatment. It's kind of like um, how uh, and you're right on that because um, you know when you go to the doctor, you're, it's in your DNA that you're susceptible to high blood pressure. You're susceptible to heart failure, strokes. You know that sin, that salvation. You know is not in. DNA. The salvation is from Christ, but our sinful nature <coughs> is still in our DNA. I know that I know the issue of timing of being in Adam or in Christ. You know, that's why there's all these different views of timing and justification, and, and all those things come along with it. Talking about in what sense are you here or there when this happens here or there. And I know it does get confusing. Um, I think the idea is to slowly uh, establish certain things and nail them down and then do one thing at a time you know, that you can be sure of and get the other things out of your head. Uh, that doesn't mean that we know everything and we can say, you know, we're done thinking about it, we've arrived, you know. But uh, there's always things I have on the back burner that are I'm still thinking through and, and might not know how to talk about right yet, you know. But usually when I have things like that, I already, I'm already settled on some things about it. And I've already said, well, at least I'm right here right now. I've already decided I don't agree with this other stuff about it, and I'm, I'm still going forward on it. Uh, the, uh, connected to that question, I know there's a lot of talk uh, about rewards uh, because of service in reference to believers. And I'm not real big on talking about that um, for a couple different reasons. Um, I was taught that when I was a youngster in a false way. And that's not the reason not to look at it. I'm not saying that. But I can see in a practical way that if somebody talks a lot about that, they can mess up somebody's uh, incentive for doing what they should do. You could cause somebody to say, I'm doing this to get something. And my opinion, I don't care what anybody says. I'd rather not talk about it. So I don't mess up somebody's incentive. I'd rather just talk about here's what we ought to do and not talk about whether there is or is not rewards. I don't care. You know, but I would say here's what the scripture says we are to do. Uh, you want to talk about rewards? Find out later if you get in here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> what reward could be bigger than eternal life? Right. right. Christ. Christ is our reward. Uh, you know, I agree. Some people think when you get to heaven, you know, well, the more good works you do, you know, your place is going to have air conditioning, but I'm going to have a pool in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> We're still going to be in heaven. What difference does it make? I mean, you know. <laughs> a lot of Sovereign Grace Reform Calvinist people believe that, and even some that believe that, that people looked up to as like the top dogs of Calvinism, like uh, I think it was Whitfield that somebody asked, do you think you'll see uh, Wesley in heaven? <laughs> and he said, uh, no. And the person thought, all right, I agree. 
He said, no, the reason is they're going to be so close to the throne, I won't be able to see him for the brightness of the glory because he's so close to the throne. That's ridiculous. That's... Uh, he's got to make it to heaven first, and it might be a little harder than the false gospel. <laughs> yeah. I was saying, then Spurgeon said about what it's looking like, that 13th apostle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, a lot of weird ideas out there. Uh, but I, I remember talking to a, uh, a real bad primitive Baptist uh, preacher, and we were talking about obedience and, and uh, incentives. And uh, he talked about this thing about rewards and I said you know I, I don't want to think about that and he said why would you even obey that if you don't get anything out of it <laughs> and man he just like exposed himself right there he, wow. he, he's dead now but uh, he uh, sounds like he was dead then. yeah he was <laughs> but I mean it was clear it was clear um, <laughs> It was clear he was exposing himself. It kind of gave himself away there. It's like, are you serious? You just said that it came out your mouth? <laughs> I think some people don't even realize what they're saying. Yeah. Sometimes people just repeat things that they've heard. Right. And uh, in conversations with my friends, you know, uh, I try to ask them, do you understand the implications of what you're saying? Have you unpacked it? You know, to know what it really means, what you're what you're saying, and uh, I mean, sometimes you get somewhere, and sometimes you don't. Right. Well, some people, depending on uh, how they've been trained to think in school, or not think, uh, they 